Hey everybody, Kevin Pelton, NBA writer for ESPN.com, back here on YouTube for the debut of my video, hashtag Pelton Mailbag. Uh, excited to do this. It's going to be an addition to continuing to do the mailbag on ESPN.com, on ESPN Insider. But, you know, I feel like the video format allows us to touch on slightly different questions, maybe more quick hitters, uh, some things that are kind of more opinion based, whereas, you know, kind of the things that I can dig in on and, and really analyze tend to work better for the written mailbags. We'll have one of those later this week. And uh, as always, Submit your questions using, using the hashtag Pelton Mailbag or Pelton Mailbag at gmail.com for consideration. Before we get into that today, I did want to touch briefly on the report by my ESPN colleague, Adrian Wojnarowski, that the Celtics have engaged in trade discussions with the Brooklyn Nets for Kevin Durant. Obviously, Jalen Brown would be the centerpiece of any of those deals. And this is something I thought back to the Malcolm Brogdon trade that the Celtics made earlier this offseason, that that sort of made it easier for them to get in the Durant sweepstakes because it increased their depth. And now all of a sudden, if you send out one of their other guards, be it Derek White, be it Marcus Smart, they've got cover for that player with Brogdon also in the backcourt as a ball handler and shot creator. So, you know... I uh, obviously, a lot of negotiation points here. If you're the Celtics, you'd much rather keep Marcus Smart to play with Kevin Durant and send out Derek White in a deal like that. You know, is it three contributors? Is Grant Williams someone that the Nets maybe look at in, in addition to that? And then the Celtics sort of have to make a decision. Obviously, Jalen Brown is much younger than Kevin Durant. You can envision Brown and Jason Tatum playing together for a decade here after getting to the NBA Finals last year. But the other element of it that uh, my colleague Bobby Marks mentioned on Twitter is Jalen Brown, you know, his contract, because of the fact that it's less than the max, it doesn't really lend itself to an extension. So the Celtics do have to sweat out. Brown is probably going to hit unrestricted free agency in a few years here. Will he resign? Is there a chance of him leaving and them getting nothing in return? If they think that's a realistic possibility, then I think it makes sense to be aggressive pursuing Kevin Durant. Otherwise, I would probably say, you know, let's stick with what we've got here. And we already saw Jalen Brown tweeting, you know, cryptically on Monday morning after these reports came out. And uh, you don't want to kind of upset the apple cart by pursuing this trade if it's not something you're actually going to do. So those are my thoughts. But, you know, Boston's still an interesting position to take last year's NBA Finals loser at Kevin Durant. We've seen before that's a pretty successful formula for winning multiple championships. All right, let's get into the questions. Uh, let's start off with this on a similar topic from Ryan Tressler on Twitter. How many teams do you think can realistically put a package together to make a Durant trade satisfactory for both Sean Marks and Durant? I, I think the answer is probably, you know, a handful of teams. Uh, part of the issue here is I think teams have the ability to do this. The question right now is whether they want to go as heavily in as the Nets presumably want for a player who is in his mid thirties, you know, is still considered going into last year's playoffs the best player in the league but you're not talking about getting five years of a player's prime necessarily which makes this a little bit different than the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes that we've got going on right now and I think the other element we see is you know look there was once a time where the prices for these stars were such that anytime you got the star player in a trade you know as long as that player stayed healthy you were likely to win that trade I think that period is gone now. Look, the Lakers would probably still do the trade for Anthony Davis because they won the championship. And, uh, you know, as my buddy and colleague Brian Windhorst likes to say, winning a championship means never having to say sorry. But also, they gave up a lot for Anthony Davis. And, you know, now exacerbated by the Russell Westbrook trade, we've seen that leave them in a situation with limited depth. The Clippers would probably still make the, the Paul George trade because they might be the favorites this year with George and Kawhi Leonard healthy. But again, they gave up a lot and, you know, they felt it this past year when they dropped out of the playoffs and had to send a lottery pick to the Oklahoma City Thunder. We've seen teams regret the Russell Westbrook trades that they've made lately. And I think Brooklyn, if they could go back in time, probably would never make either of the James Harden trades that they made. So, you know, nowadays, I think you have to worry, especially in the wake of what we saw the Minnesota Timberwolves give up for Rudy Gobert. Is this going to be too much for us to still have, you know, a contending team? Are we ultimately going to regret how much we gave up for Kevin Durant? And that's why I think teams haven't been able to make these packages that they could, you know, hypothetically do in New Orleans, Toronto, Miami, Phoenix. I think those are still the four teams and in Boston will throw them in there as well. The five teams that are best positioned to do that. 
All right, next question from at Chris Porcelli on Twitter. I've been thinking about this for a little. When does Shea Gildress Alexander get Drewed, referring to Drew Holiday, and sent out of Oklahoma City for picks? This is a conversation I had a couple of times during summer league with people there. And, you know, I, I did think it was a reasonable possibility before last year's draft, before the 2021 draft, if you could trade Gildress Alexander while he was still on his rookie contract, get a high lottery pick in return. That might have made sense. Now that Gilgis Alexander is on an extension, I think it's a very different situation than the Holiday one. Let's remember that Drew Holiday, when the New Orleans Pelicans traded him to Milwaukee, he was age 30, entering the final season of his contract, had, you know, I think given some indication that he wasn't planning to resign. Shea Gilgis Alexander is 24. He hasn't even started a five-year extension yet. It officially began July 1st, but obviously hasn't taken part in any team activities since then yet. They have a long time, Oklahoma City, to figure this out. And we've seen them, you know, sort of stay the course. They extended Kenrich Williams. They re-signed Lugens Dort after declining his team option to a five-year deal. They're looking to have a degree of continuity on this roster in addition to the young draft picks they're bringing in. That's eventually going to lead to some tough choices just in terms of roster spots as, you know, new players continue cycling in and you've still got, you know, these draft picks that they've made before, you know, the, the tail Maladons of the world and figure out how they sort of fit if you've only got 15 roster spots. But that doesn't affect Shea Gilgis Alexander. The only reason I think that you would start to think about trading Gilgis Alexander is if you got to the point where you feel like Josh Giddy is more important to our future than Shea Gilgis Alexander, and the two of those guys can't play together or not going to be maximized together. And I think we're a long ways from either of those things being true. Gilgis Alexander has a lot of experience playing with another ball handler. Giddy last season, Chris Paul, his first season in Oklahoma City, as well as Dennis Schroeder. They played a lot of those three guys together. So I, I don't think there's any reason to think that there's urgency for the Thunder to make that move right now. It's not like Gilgis Alexander's timetable is wildly different from Chet Holmgren's, which, you know, now I think kind of defines this franchise going forward. Uh, Brian Frederick asked, what would be the impact of eliminating the corner three in the NBA? I mean, I think that's a fascinating one, especially as you talk about the possibility of moving the three-point line back, because unless you were to exaggerate the degree where the above the break, the top of the key three is different from the corner three, that would kind of inevitably mean eliminating the corner three, because you know people will talk about, let's expand, let's widen the court. That's not a realistic consideration for teams. The amount of space you have courtside is fixed, and you're talking about losing an entire row of those courtside tickets that drive a lot of a lot of the revenue from teams. So, you know, that's not something that they're going to talk about. If you got rid of it, I think the big question to me is: Would guys still stand in the corners? Would you have to guard them there if it was just basically a long two from 23 feet? Uh, there's been some some debate over the years about is the corner three shot at a higher percentage percentage because of the fact that it's shorter. And, you know, this is the thing I looked at in a written mailbag before. There is some evidence the length has something to do with it, but it's also just kind of the nature of it's that's where teams help off of. There's no off the dribble threes from the corner. That's not a thing that exists. It's strictly catch and shoot threes, which tend to be easier. So I think those factors, you know, are part of what make the catch and shoot three so valuable. But if you don't have the extra point, the, suddenly they don't outweigh the value of having someone standing elsewhere. So I, I think that would be a fun thing for the G League to experiment with it at some point, just to see kind of what it looks like, because it would be so different from what we're used to in the modern NBA. Uh, Dan Gordon asked, lots of attention in, on the increase in three-point shots as a share of field goal attempts, but it seems from watching the NBA my whole life that alley-oops have also become much more common, especially in the half court. Do the stats support that? And in this case, Dan, they do. Uh, Second Spectrum has a category for lob dunks, which I think you know, translates to alley-oops. And however you slice it, half court overall on a per possession basis, last season was the highest in the nine seasons for which we have camera tracking data. The most recent five seasons, all higher than the four before that. And I think that's part of a larger thing that I've written about a little bit. My friend Seth Partnow of The Athletic has written a lot about this, that you know people think of the three-point increase is taking away from these exciting shots at the rim. And it's quite the opposite in a lot of ways. The spacing that they provide has opened things up at the rim and made it more possible for these lob finishes because defenders feel compelled to stay at home on their shooters. Uh, 
the, the increase in three point attempts has largely been a product of teams shooting fewer catch and shoot two pointers over time and slightly fewer off the dribble too, as those have also decreased a little bit, but we still see a lot of those what Seth calls star shots uh, from mid range from two point range. But uh, you know, it's never been a matter of, do we want a shot at the rim or do we want a three? We want both of those things other than maybe in transition is the one place where is teams run to the three point line players run to the three point line, maybe a few less shots at the rim there, but uh, in the half court an increase for sure. All right. Lastly, Alejandro asked, Wondering if this is something that can be proven or disproven by your approach. It seems to me that the NBA relative to other leagues is in a constant cycle of one, enacting well-intentioned rules, that two, some players and coaches find the holes in to exploit mercilessly, and then three, having to enact new rules to counter these new problems. I don't see this level of rule gaming in other leagues. Is this an NBA issue mostly? And if so, why? I, I think my first answer is it's probably a basketball issue. You know, there are some things in the NFL, there's kind of a cycle of how much contact are we going to allow in terms of illegal contact, defending eligible receivers, you know, how much contact in terms of pass interference that that happens, but it's not necessarily individual players, I think, exploiting it. It's more, you know, team wide strategies and just kind of the NFL dialing how much they want the offense defense balance, which usually is going to tilt towards offense inevitably. So, you know, we saw some of that with Peyton Manning versus the Patriots defense in the 2000s, but it's not the same degree and it's not necessarily individuals in the way that you're talking about. I, I think part of the reason this happens, number one, there are 40 fouls per game on average in the NBA. Compare that to 12 penalties per game in the NFL. Uh, MLB, it's not the same degree. You know, obviously, obviously every ball strike is some de- to some degree subjective, but the ability to exploit that other than catcher framing, I guess, would be another situation where individuals did kind of learn this, but we don't have the cycle of, of necessarily, you know, changing the rules and then finding new exploits. It feels like that one's kind of been legislated to a degree out of the game with more consistency in the strike zone. I mean, maybe there's some element in this in soccer that, uh, you know, I'm just not savvy enough to pick up, but I, I think it largely affects basketball. And why does it affect the NBA in particular? We'll compare it to college basketball or other levels. Guys are there a maximum of now five years in case of college with the extra COVID year that uh, many players are taking advantage of as opposed to Chris Paulus in his uh, 17th season in the NBA. Uh, he's got a lot more time to figure out the rules, figure out ways to exploit them and take advantage of them. And you can't have that cycle because a player probably isn't going to be in college long enough for that ins- entire cycle to take place or in high school or at any other level. So, you know, I think the NBA, it obviously has the most intelligent players in the world that care the most about their game. This also brings me to one of my favorite takes. Everyone talks about how competitive players were in the 80s and 90s because of the fact that they didn't shake hands and they didn't go out to dinner after the game. And my take here is, look, if players were really so competitive, they would have been taking more advantage of abilities to exploit the rules. There was more of a sense of, you know, we can't, you know, do things that are against the spirit of the game back then. But I've never seen a handshake or dinner after a game put any points on the board. Chris Paul, when he does the rip through move or whatever else, that puts a couple points on the board. That to me is a lot more competitive than whether your buddy is after the game. So this is my counter take on why the current NBA is actually more competitive than it's ever been before. And uh, I think on that note, we'll wrap up this mailbag. Thanks so much to everybody who submitted questions. Please keep those coming. Again, hashtag Pelton Mailbag on Twitter or Pelton Mailbag at gmail.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.